Welcome back to Fabulous Creations. I'm Ron Farber Newman and I love Halloween, which you may have already known if you saw my video from last year around this time where I made Billy Butcherson's tombstone from Hocus Pocus. I always like making homemade decorations when I can, so this year I decided to make some laser cut luminaries. The inspiration for this project came from a decoration I recall seeing in the Halloween aisle when I was a kid. They were effectively paper bags, but orange, with pumpkin faces either printed on the bag or cut into the bag, I don't recall for sure. But they came with tea light candles for the inside, and you're supposed to put them along your walkway with either sand or rocks inside to weigh them down. I always liked the idea of the sidewalk up to the house lined with these, but the practical execution always had me a little wary of a fire, even from a young age. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't exactly feel comfortable leaving a fire lit inside a paper bag outside unattended where a gust of wind or lost spirit could easily blow it away, sand or no sand. So with the general principle at hand, can we make something that achieves roughly the same look while being a lot more sturdy and less prone to collapsing in on itself or being blown away? I think so. Let's give it a go. To start, I came up with rough dimensions for my box based on what the internet told me a paper lunch sack measured in at. I wanted these roughly the same size to be a nod to the original paper bags. Using those measurements, I took to the super handy laser cut box generator tool I found online a while back. It's awesome. All you do is enter your box dimensions, tell it how thick the material is that you'll be cutting it out of, tweak a few other settings, and boom, it generates a perfect vector cut file with all the finger joints dialed in exactly. You can also enter a value for curve compensation, which you may need to play with if you determine your joints are too tight or too loose. This is entirely dependent on the laser you're using and its beam size, but in general, a value of 0.002 or so has worked for me. I plan to do a video talking about curve in more detail down the road, but that's another show. For now, just experiment a bit. It's the best way to learn. And in case you're wondering, I'll have a link to the Spox generator down in the description. Exporting my generated box gave me an SVG file, which is a super common software agnostic vector format that can be opened by most vector tools such as Inkscape or the like. Adobe Illustrator is my weapon of choice though, so I use that to further develop my luminary box. Once open, you'll see how the box generator laid out our box. Since this will be an open box, we don't really need the top, so we can delete that. One design feature I really wanted these boxes to have, to really nail home the paper lunch sack look, was a zigzag pattern along the top open edge of the box. To do this, I could have deleted the square finger joints from the top of this edge and started fresh, but instead I decided to use them for spacing. I added an extra vertex to the middle of each finger and to the middle of each slot, then highlighted the original vertices, making sure to leave my centered ones alone, and poof, deleted them. This left my centered vertices to connect directly to one another, giving me the zigzag pattern. I did this on the side piece of my box as well. But these zigzags are a little too neat for my taste. Too perfect. To take care of that, I added some randomness by changing the depth of each point, making some cut deeper into the box while others didn't go quite as far in. I also nudged the points to the left or to the right a little bit to make them a little more chaotic and so it wasn't always the same angle from one zig to its neighboring zag. After I was happy with both pieces, the back and the right, I cloned them to replace their matching face of the box. The great thing about the box generator is that the front and back will always have the same finger layout, as will the left and right and the top and the bottom, if we were using the top. For the bottom, we could leave this unmodified, but I decided to tweak mine with the idea that we may want drainage holes if this is something left outside during all kinds of weather. By raising the bottom up off the ground a bit, there's less surface area sitting in water. To do this, we'll make a copy of the fingers in question, isolate them, and then close them to make rectangles, then moving them into place. These will get cut out entirely, allowing the fingers of the bottom face to slide in. We'll do this to all four faces. I also added those holes for water to drain through the bottom. And, of course, the luminary wouldn't be complete without a festively spooky face of your choosing. You can draw your own, trace one from a photo, or just search vector jack-o'-lantern face and all sorts of results will come up. With my completed cut file ready, it was time to head to the makerspace for everyone's favorite part, the laser cutting itself. This Makerspace laser and I have had a lot of history over the past few years, but if I might tease you with some developing news, I may very soon be purchasing one of my own now that my garage shop conversion is nearing completion. I'm super excited to tell you more in a future video, but again, that's another show. I got started by finding a piece of scrap, one quarter inch plywood that looked like it would fit my cup file nicely. I believe this piece is from a project I completed three years ago, which just goes to prove that saying about makers and woodworkers never being able to part with their scrap wood. There wasn't any fancy setup to do, just focusing the laser on the surface of my board and get to cutting. I recently got a new camera for use inside the laser, so enjoy some of these higher than usual fidelity shots of the cuts happening. The sad irony of using this higher end camera is that it shows just how used and abused the Makerspace laser is. 
When I bought my very used truck a few years ago, it had a beat not babied sticker on the back window and I can't help but feel like that phrase applies to this Makerspace laser too. After the box parts themselves were cut and I performed the old check to make sure the parts release properly test that is sometimes needed with this older laser, the last thing to cut out was the face of my jack-o'-lantern. After all my cuts were done, even though I had done a few test finger joints with smaller pieces, I did a cursory test to make sure the pieces fit together snugly, but not too tight, which is typically what you're looking for with finger joints, laser cut or otherwise. Once back from the makerspace, I applied my first coat of paint in my Beat Not Babied portable spray booth. Since these will be lit from the inside and we want the glow to be extra prominent, I used yellow paint for the inside faces. I applied multiple coats of paint plus primer spray paint over the course of a few hours until the surface of the wood was uniformly glossy. After the yellow had dried, it was time for the orange. Same process here. Build up the layers of paint until uniform and sheen. When the orange side had also dried, I could begin final assembly. I added a small bit of wood glue between each finger and quickly assembled each piece into its proper place. Since I raised the bottom of my box up and into the height of the box a little bit during the design process, it's worth noting that the bottom cannot be the last piece added, as it would effectively be locked in from every direction. Just wanted to call that out in case you make a box with that style of bottom, so that you're not frantically rushing to disassemble then reassemble. Totally not speaking from experience. I used a damp paper towel to clean up glue squeeze out, then used the stereotypical way too many clamps to hold it together as it dried. Once out of its clamps, I realized the front face could use a last coat or two of the orange paint as to give the end grain fingers of the side pieces of the box a little more paint since they weren't really given much previously as I'd only been focusing on the faces. But since the face of the box had already had its design cut and I didn't want to get any orange paint onto the inside yellow portions of the box, I taped a paper towel inside the box to catch any overspray before doing these final coats. A few hours of drawing later, I could call this project complete and do the inaugural lighting. Now obviously a safer bet, safer than not using paper bags, would be to use an LED tea light, but I wanted to see how cool this looked with a real candle, as the LED tea lights available today still haven't nailed that real flame look that I love so much. So I lit it up and dimmed the lights, and there she is. Now this project was a bit of an experiment in that I only wanted to make one before making a whole walkway worth of them, and I'm glad I did, because you may have realized one shortcoming of this design that I guess I didn't really consider while planning it, and that is that one of the most charming aspects of those sand-filled fire hazards is the serene glow that they create as the paper's translucency filters the flame's light. The solid-walled plywood construction in my design just doesn't do that. So at some point in the future, I'm going to revisit this idea using acrylic, perhaps frosted acrylic, to achieve that same charming glow. But this project wasn't a total waste, as it looks just as charming in a partially lit setting or atop a mantle, where I think it looks particularly nice in our house. So while not the perfect replica of what we are going for, I still hope you enjoyed this laser cutting project and learned something here. I'll have more updates on my shop conversion and my upcoming laser purchase in my next few videos, so if you're not subscribed already, I sure would appreciate your consideration so you can follow along more easily. Otherwise, have a safe and happy Halloween, and I'll see you next time. Stay spooky.